God's voice in our life in the last uh, couple months. And uh, as we were, uh, I'll just give a brief, is that I felt, uh, this will all tie in eventually, so just give you some grace here. I uh, felt that we need, I needed to leave my job at Public Works on a specific date. That was February 2nd. And as you know in the paper, in the paper that uh, I did that. And I left on February 2nd. Left everything. Uh, but I didn't have a job. I had nothing. I was told to leave on February 2nd. And we've been praying about it for a while. And um, we were sitting in the, in the kitchen kind of laughing about me being unemployed. <laughs> it's been... I don't even remember the last time I was unemployed, but I, I, was, un, I, was, I was laughing. I said, you know, yeah, basically um, that was happening. And Aaron said, well, what, what do you think the timeline is here? Because we, we didn't have a job offer, we didn't have anything. And I, was, I just felt like I needed to say, in his time. So when you sang that song, I was like, Aaron looked at me, I was like, no coincidences with God. There's no coincidences. <laughs> and also, going in forward to, today's, to my message today is on the cover of the bulletin, it says, Then thou shalt walk in thy, in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. Proverbs. And uh, that, that's true. Amen. I'm, I'm going to tell you straight up. It is true. And one of the messages we kept hearing over and over over the last couple of months, uh, as Aaron and I, and we made a war room, by the way, which uh, if you haven't done that, you need to get that done. Um, we, Aaron and I were praying in it. And um, we were like, you know, please give us some scripture because I had left the county. I hadn't done a lot of things, and he gave us scriptures, and I won't read them today, but basically, one of the scriptures was, either you do or you do not believe who I say I am, and if you do, and we said we did, he gave us Jeremiah 29, which is, I have good plans for you, but you've got to be obedient. <laughs> so, that leads into the rest of the message, is obedience. And I've really, every piece of scripture in the last several months has been about obedience, I think he, uh, there's many things to mention on obedience, um, but one thing is that it's not something that happens immediately. It's something that you build up to, it's something that uh, God leads you through, and it's something that there's a lot of things got to be set in place before you actually can become obedient to God. And one of that is, how can you have obedience if you don't have faith? How do you have faith if you don't trust? Right, so you've got to trust have faith, then you've got to be obedient. And, I mean, tr I mean, yeah, true obedience. Um, and there's obedience in small things, and there's obedience in large things. And we know what Jesus says is that, you know, to go back to the story of the talents, if you're faithful in small things, that you can be faithful in large things. You can't be faithful in small things, he won't trust you with the large thing. So, that's been on my heart for years, is how... Uh, do I get trusted with more? Because I felt like I was confident in the little things. What I found out was, is that you can't just do it once. If you're going to be trusted in little things, he'll, he, will, he will give you a lot of little things to make sure you can trust. Now, who doesn't do that with your children or whatever? Is that you want to make sure they're going to be good. So one of the things that... Um, I want to give you a couple stories and we'll go into some scriptures and things the Lord led in my life about this whole obedience thing. Uh, first is, um, my brother-in-law, Arby, came to me, uh, what, February? Maybe February. He goes, we ought to start running. Y'all, I didn't run more than a mile, ever. Um, and he said, no, you need to do this. So I did it. And a couple months later, I, I, I was getting into it a little bit. But I, I felt God tell me, you need to run. So he started me off at four miles. It scared me. The first three days, I was hurt so bad I couldn't walk into my office. And God said, you, mean, you need to run, you need to run, you need to run. And I didn't tell him for like a couple months. And we were running past Wayne's house. And I told him, I said, I'm doing this in obedience to God. And he said that he felt that he needed to press me for it. And then he said, maybe this is one way that I can help you in your ministry of being obedient. And I never thought of it. You always think about obedience to God would be, you know, go to someone's house randomly because you're told to. But in this case, he just had to get me running, which is crazy. <clears throat> but he did it in obedience, and then I had to do it in obedience. And then when we talked about it, we realized we had the same goal. 
So and that was a revelation to me, uh, because that, that was a really small thing. I mean, what's it matter to God if I run five miles? What I think God was saying is, will you do it? That's right. So I felt better. Everything got better with me health-wise. And just now it's turned into something I can't do without. But really, it was being obedient. And we see that often in your life. How many times you have that small prompting to go? Brenda was telling me about some problems she had yesterday. And I, I really feel that these little things, if you're faithful and obedient in little things, you can be trusted. You have faith. You will move forward. So the best example I can think of is Abraham. So let's, if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Genesis chapter 11. And I told my Sunday, the Sunday school class, my Sunday school class, that they were getting a little preview to what I was felt like I was being shown. And I just thought, I just thought this was great. Um, I had never paid attention to this before. Before we talk about Abraham, we've got to talk about his dad. We've got to talk about Terah. Anybody know anything about Terah? Well, really, nobody knows anything about Terah. I'm sure there's a Bible out there, but Terah was Abraham's father. And the, the whole point of what I'm getting ready to say today is obedience and being obedient to what God's will is for your life and seeking that earnestly and then acting upon it isn't just for you. It's not for you. One thing God has shown me over the, over the past few years is that the blessings are always multiple. In multiple occasions, over multiple periods of time, multiply everything. He doesn't just do one thing. And if you can think of any example in all years of where God did one thing, one thing very specifically, and didn't bless anybody else, and you could almost call that collateral blessings, not collateral damage, <laughs> collateral blessings. Can anyone think of one? Yeah, me either. So if you think one, come bring to it. I can't think of a single time when he didn't do it in multiple ways. So we'll, go, we'll look at Terah, uh, just chapter 31. And uh, I'm sorry, chapter 11, and we'll go, yeah, 31. Okay. So Terah took his son Abram, and his son, and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abraham's wife, Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur to the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Now, what's that tell us about Terah and Abram? Anybody? It doesn't say why he went to Canaan. But I got a feeling he was prompted to go to Canaan. But he didn't go. He didn't go all the way. He stopped at Haran. But what do you think that showed Abram? Any guesses? Just call it from the crowd. I like participatory... <laughs> Obedience too. What did Terah's actions say to his son Abraham? He didn't listen. No, he listened. He did listen. He did. Well, he he moved all the way. He settled. He settled, but he did it. What I believe happened here, and of course, I'm you know I'm sure there's better thing, but I've really been thinking about this and praying about it. I believe that Terah showed Abraham that it was possible to leave. You got to remember where, it, where Terah was, was, was in the, the Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia in the land of Ur, which was later on Babylon, right? And what many people don't think of today is, today is the stinking desert, right? But back in the Babylonian days, it was a fertile, very attractive wetlands. And it was there, the reason they called it the Fertile Crescent was the Tigris Chief Rays would flood and come at all times from it. But the reason it got ruined is because Saddam Hussein decided to go attack Iran and drain the whole wetlands like an idiot. But really, it was a beautiful place until about 1970-something, the war with Iran. So it was pretty. But you can almost say that Terra was comfortable. He had built up a family. He was comfortable. But then he moved out of his comfort zone. Now, we don't know why. I didn't say why he did it. Um, but Abraham, Abram was brought out of his comfort zone once. So when the ultimate call came for him to complete, maybe, it doesn't say, what his father, his original goal was, Abram knew that it was possible. I wonder how many people don't obey God because it sounds too crazy. 
It's too much. I can't leave. I got deep roots. I like my job. How many people stop because it's just too much? So Abram, not exactly poor in the land of the of the of her of Haran, has a wife. Of course, he has a lot of you see, you know, had a lot of female and male slaves and animals and all that. Then God sends him literally to the stinking desert. Sends him to the land of Canaan. Now, if anyone remembers, the land of Canaan was the land of Ham, son of Noah, and Noah cursed Ham and all the descendants, right? That they would be slaves of slaves. So this is the equivalent, Clifton Ford's talk here, of me telling uh, Dale, go to downtown Brisbane and leave. <laughs> In other words, Dale's going to say, no, no, not a chance. Or, you know, go live in D.C. or, or somewhere else because he's such, so far out of his comfort zone he couldn't stand it. Now, of course, Abram doesn't stop in Canaan. He goes on to Egypt. And then when he comes out of Egypt, he comes back in strength. He receives the promise of God. God stops him in Canaan. And he says, this is what I'm going to give you. But he doesn't tell him to stop. And what I'd like for everyone to, I want, I want to point out to everybody is that Abraham was so trusted by God and so obedient to a point that God could trust him with the ultimate vision of what he's going to do with him. And he knew Abram was going to know that that promise will be fulfilled. He trusted him to a point where he knew. So it was a mutual trust. Abram trusted God enough to move everything and go way out of his comfort zone. He also trusted in the provision. To me, God's trust to Abraham is different. There are some, and I think we're all guilty of this. If I told Jim, I'm going to give you a million dollars tomorrow, let's say Jim had a job, Abraham would have quit his job waiting on that million dollars. <laughs> uh, but the other thing is, is that God trusted him the vision and knew Abraham would do what it took to make it, to get it done. That's a big deal. He didn't, he knew Abram wasn't going to give up when the promise wasn't immediately delivered. He knew it was going to keep going. So in Jim's case, if he's to Abraham, I'm going to say, I will give you a million dollars, but I don't tell him a date. That's my promise to you. How many would quit your job? Glad I'll come. Or no, keep working, trusting that that would come. There's a difference. So Abraham was very obedient. And one thing I noticed about the blessing of Abraham and his call of obedience was that it wasn't just Abraham called to be obedient. Both Abram and Sarai got their names or new names from God in the same conversation in Genesis 17. Uh, it wasn't just Abraham who got the blessing. Sarah got it. Their household got it. Their unborn child got the blessing. And so the idea of generational obedience and generational blessing with a generational relationship with God is the result of obedience. It's not just about you. In other words, you're setting up the future of your family by knowing and being obedient to God. That's a big deal. So to me, when I read this, I thought... Man, how about messed up? You know, what is my example? When Ben sees me, what does he see? Does he see someone who's willing to step out in faith, or does he see someone who's handicapped himself? When I when we talk about Jesus in the public, when we do things, is he watching a man who is faithful or one who always makes a compromise? What is your example? And that hit heavy. In fact, when I was at my job interview on Wednesday, um, they, we kind of got to that point. They asked me, they said, uh, they said Chris, we, we know that you've left Public Works and that you haven't applied anywhere else because God led me to apply to nowhere else and the job fell on my lap. We know that you feel like God's calling you here. What in the world are you doing? I said, are you here just because of that? Did you pray? Were the scripture references? Why did you come? Uh, I think basically they were trying to get the crazy meter, right? <laughs> right so it's true. And I told them that it was all of the above. I was being obedient to what God called me to do. 
I was I had plenty of scripture references to move forward, and I told them I was in no way worried because if they didn't offer the job, we were still heading to Charlotte because I felt that strongly to be called down there, and something would be provided. I wasn't worried about it, and uh, they actually took comfort in that, and it was a really good thing. I was I was very very bold with them, uh, but my idea that I share with them is how can I claim to be a faithful follower of Christ and God and, 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 and hear from Him and be obedient, but not really. There is no partial obedience. Well, there shouldn't be. There's plenty of examples of partial obedience, but there shouldn't be. And there's a price you pay for partial obedience. So, in setting up the whole obedience thing I'm talking about here, one thing is partial obedience. And so that leads me to uh, 1 Samuel 15, 17 through 19. Someone wants to get to that. And I won't read it because it's pretty long, because really the whole chapter fits. But anybody remember the story of Saul, King Saul? Are oh, you killing me? Come on, someone knows King Saul, right? Yes. All right, great. When, when Saul went to battle, God said, destroy everything. Everything. Cattle, everything. Destroy everything. What does Saul do? Anybody remember? He kept some, right? And then when Samuel called him on it, what did he say? Samuel shows up and goes, I hear bleeding of sheep. There shouldn't be bleeding of sheep. Why is there bleeding of sheep? And Saul said what? Save him for worship. Yeah, he was saving him for worship. Let's be all know the lie. <laughs> he was saving him for himself. And what happened to Saul after that? He lost favor. He lost his anointing. From that day on, he said, you have fallen from God, you have lost your anointing, but go to another. And then Samuel did what? Samuel went to go bless God with him, and then refused to go anywhere else with him, and basically, through some stories, went and found David. That's what happened. Saul was partially obedient. And God said, that's not good enough for someone I have anointed to be my servant. So if you are anointed to serve God, there is no partial obedience. You must move forward. And I feel very strongly about that. And there's a lot of cost with it. It's a big deal. Uh, in Ephesians uh, 5, 6, it says, The wrath of God be upon those who are disobedient. In Titus 1, 16, uh, basically the thing is you are denying God even by being partially obedient. And I... I took that to heart. Where, where, where have I been partially obedient? Because the last thing I want to do is be an example of partial obedience. So it gets back to the whole thing. Either I believe who he says he is, or I don't. And so Aaron and I decided that we are going to believe it. And basically the whole thing at the end is, you can't be lukewarm. In Revelation, God says, if you're hot or cold, I could use you. If you lukewarm, I spit you out. And that's actually true with obedience. So, disobedience and partial disobedience are a big deal, especially if you want to get anything done with God. But there is hope. As there's always hope. So the Lord pointed me to Jeremiah 29 11. Who can, who can quote Jeremiah 29 11? For I know the plans I have for you, declared the Lord. Absolutely. For you and not harm you. That's right. Anybody know the context of Gen Jeremiah 29 11? Mm -hmm. The captivity coming back. That's right, that's right. Those who couldn't hear Doug, Jeremiah 29 11 is a wonderful promise in the midst of turmoil. Basically, what he says is, I am sending you into exile, and I, basically, you're being punished for your disobedience. So, in Jeremiah, he said, I'm sending you to Babylon for 70 years. But so, even though you've been disobedient, and even though I'm exiling you for 70 years, I will take care of you and redeem you. That's a powerful message. So even though Saul lost his, obedience, uh, lost his anointing, you know, even though he had trouble, he was able to be redeemed. Even, uh, I mean, you look at Peter, deny. Look at, um, oh, there's, there's so many where... They were not obedient or didn't follow, yet were redeemed. God always provides 
cure for redemption of your errors. Always. Always. So I've got a couple questions to ask. What would have happened if Tara had not been even partially obedient? Any takers? Any takers want to have? I think God is still love. Oh, absolutely. Look at all the stuff that I missed out. You wonder what would have happened if he hadn't been obedient to show Abraham to be obedient, therefore. Right. There's the key. There's the key. What if Abraham had been like, nah? I'm good. I'll sit right here in Heron for a nice place. What if Peter had stayed with the nets? <clears throat> And what if Jesus had said, too much? <laughs> we know he had the option in the Garden of Gethsemane. Nope. He had the option. But he didn't say it's too much. So with that, I want to make sure that, that if even if you're being fully obedient or you're being not so fully obedient, as I'm sure we all are, you need to know that it, redemption is possible. There is a good plan. He orders your steps. And just like he says in the, in the, on the top of our, in our bulletin, that um, your foot will be sure and not stable. So what I'd like to do this time is um, we'll call my family up in a little bit. We've got a, a song in, in just a little bit. We, I, can't, I can't even describe to you over the last few months about how we have been molded and how we've been led and how we've been blessed and how we've been um, sometimes I'm going to be honest with you, beaten upon to, to do what we need to do. It's been a wonderful journey, uh, but it's been, it's been difficult. It's been very difficult. So I'll call it a minute. But one thing I want to make sure everyone knows and is it even, how, how do you feel about what I said? You need to know that the altar and it, here is always open for forgiveness. It's always open for you to cry out. It's always open, period. Maybe even to ask what you could do to be obedient. And at first I thought that was scary. What if I asked for it? He says, ask and you shall receive. And he means fully. And he pointed that out to me about December, that I had asked for it. I got it, but without going into too many details, all I can tell you is that we are being blessed beyond measure. I came, I came to tell you, it is, it's been wonderful, <laughs> absolutely. The last two months have been kind of stressful, but that's over with. And we are, we are reaping the benefits and the blessings from, from our, our walk in faith. So if you feel so bold, come up. See what God can do for you. And if you feel the need to get on your knees and cry out to the God that loves you, please come forward and do so. And if anyone comes forward, it's wonderful. We'll pray for you. Uh, we'll call Aaron and the family up, and we're going to sing a song. And I know you guys probably heard on the radio. You heard of Crazy Faith? So bear with us. <laughs> Bringing everybody up.